Let's hear our call to worship this morning from Isaiah chapter 55, verses 6 and 7. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, that he may have compassion on him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Let's begin our worship with our opening hymn, hymn number 393, Come ye sinners, poor and wretched, hymn number 393, let's stand to sing.
The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Put outside, he went in and took the girl by the hand, and she got up. 
news of this spread all that region. Through all that region. Please join with me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. And there is a 
a way in which that word is to be proclaimed, not lightly or softly or uh, uh, without care or concern, but rather in a passionate way, which in, uh, brings fire and light to the people of God, illumines them in, in their understanding of God and His ways, and empowers them, equips them to love and serve the Lord. So the Catechism mentions a number of aspects of uh, faithful preaching of God's Word. Um, it would probably do uh, young men who are training for the ministry for the ministry a lot of good to meditate on this particular question. Uh, so often we go to seminaries and we learn a lot of skills and, and are equipped with a lot of academic uh, abilities, but there's much more to preaching merely than that. And this uh, answer highlights these things. Uh, first, we ought to preach sound doctrine. That is clear. Now. Mind you, doctrine is to be preached. There needs to be a, a careful, clear exposition of what God says about different topics in the whole spectrum of His revelation. Who is God? Who is Christ? What is the way of salvation? What is uh, sanctification? How do we deal with sin? These topics or doctrines need to be explained in a way which is faithful to Scripture and will be good for the hearer. Doctrine, some people uh, object to and say it divides. It, it, disunites people. Doctrine actually unites people. True doctrine unites people because they understand what God teaches them. It unites the people of God so they come around God's Word and agree that that is true. And so, sound doctrine unites the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. It does not divide. It divides the church from unbelievers. Yes, that's true. It divides the church from those who are faithful and true and those who are uh, hostile to God's Word. But doctrine needs to be taught. It needs to be sound doctrine, healthy doctrine. The idea is that this doctrine builds health and life within the congregation, makes them strong, intellectually, morally, uh, emotionally strong, able to deal with the challenges of daily living. The preacher should be diligent in his calling, ready to preach or explain the word in season and out of season. That is, when it's popular to preach certain doctrines, popular to preach uh, certain things, and also when it's unpopular. We may be approaching a time when preaching, and it already is in some respects, when preaching is unpopular. People don't want to hear the message of Jesus Christ and Him alone, salvation through Him alone, salvation through His atoning blood. That is an offense to our community, to our nation at large. But the Christian minister should not pare down his message. He should faithfully proclaim what God has to say, even if his audience is not willing to hear it. And so, be diligent in and out of season, good times or bad times. Plainly, not in the enticing words of man's wisdom. I remember studying the, uh, a number of books on writing and communicating effectively. One is by a fellow named Flesh. He talked about uh, speaking simply and, and and, and directly to folks as being the most effective way to communicate. And I, I think that that's very much true. Paul himself often commented that his preaching was not with eloquent language, not with flowery speech, poetry, and all high-minded things, but he spoke directly, plainly, clearly, that, so that people could understand. He wasn't concerned about uh, abstruse things. And so that should be a part of our preaching. In demonstration of the spirit and of power, the Christian minister must understand that he does not win over his audience merely by his eloquence, by his oratory, by his logic, by his argumentation. This is a spiritual work. And the Spirit of God must accompany that work to illumine hearts and minds and enable them to see and understand the truth and embrace it for themselves and live accordingly. And so... It should be a ministry that is in demonstration of the Spirit and power. When we see God at work changing people's hearts and lives, we know that God Himself is among us and doing great things. Preachers should be faithful, making known the whole counsel of God, not just simply focusing on one aspect of the Scripture, however important it might be, but explaining what the Word of God has to say to all of life. I think that this is something that we need to hear more and more today. Even in Reformed churches where we think of our, our, our concern to preach the whole counsel of God, sometimes we just narrow it to a certain area, like the, the, the theme of redemption, which is important. 
But God's word applies to all of life. It explains how we are to live before God as we are redeemed. How should we then live, as Francis Schaeffer once said? Well, it's by applying the word of God to all of life. And so the whole counsel of God from beginning to end needs to be proclaimed zealously with a fervent love for God and the souls of his people. That's something that comes across very powerfully in, in some pastors and teachers. You gain the sense that they are preaching because they love their audience. They're concerned for their spiritual well-being. And that's something that I need to grow in and each of us needs to grow in as well. Finally, aiming at God's glory and their salvation, conversion, edification, and salvation. That's the final goal. The glory of God and the good of mankind. So, uh, this is how preachers should, should preach. Why am I saying that to you if you're not a preacher? Well, this is the way in which you can judge those who preach before you and what you should be looking for uh, in the pastor. Let's turn in our next hymn to hymn number 256. And this hymn is a prayer to the Lord to break the bread of life and plead that the Spirit of God will open our hearts and feed us on Christ. Hymn number 256. Let's stand aside. Father gives 
me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. For I've come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all that he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in Him shall have eternal life, and I will raise Him up at the last day. At this the Jews began to grumble about Him, because He said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? Stop grumbling among yourselves, Jesus answered. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who listens to the Father and learns from Him comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only He has seen the Father. I tell you the truth. He who believes has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your forefathers ate the manna in the desert, and yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which a man may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. <coughs> this bread is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for our Savior's words this morning, and we thank you for the help of your Spirit, who illumines our hearts and minds so that we might see and appreciate the truth of what Jesus has to say. We pray that you would strengthen our faith and our understanding of what you have given for us, and we pray, too, that your Spirit would take these words of our Savior and give them to many today, drawing many from different places around the world to Jesus Christ that they too might have life everlasting, that they too might be raised on that last day to live with God. We pray for your blessing on your word in Jesus' name. Amen. It's estimated that one in seven people around the world are hungry today, with a population in 2010 of 6.5 billion people along in the earth, uh, nearly one billion of them uh, are hungry, and that's not just going without a snack before bed, but it's a significant malnutrition, significant lack of food. Nearly 70% of those are in Asia, and then another 25% live in Africa, I think of four, about 4% 4 in Latin America and elsewhere. Hunger is a significant challenge before the world, and many are concerned to try to meet that challenge by expanding our food supply. In fact, it's understood that we have plenty of food to meet all the, the needs around the world. Our country and other countries produce sufficient food to provide everyone with a healthy meal and to provide them with all the nutrition that they need. But of course, many things get in the way of that. And I might just note that some have been concerned in years past about population growth and the expansion of the population, the concern that we can't feed all of these people. We can. God will bless countries that follow Him and will enable them to feed many, to be a blessing to the world if they follow His will. But as they resist that and go their own way, then all these kinds of things develop. Warfare, which brings poverty, disease, which brings poverty, Poor education, which brings poverty, all kinds of things. As concerned as we are about feeding the world and providing nutrition for all that they might have a healthy, happy life, the Bible tells us that there's 
a greater danger when there's a famine for the word of God. The prophet Amos spoke of that to the people of Israel long ago. He warned that there would be coming a day when there would be a famine for the very words of God. People will go here and there trying to find something from God. What does God have to say about life? my life, and my future, my destiny, and they will not be able to find it. One wonders if we're not uh, close to that today. A great famine for the Word of God. No, there are many who go out proclaiming God's Word as they perceive it and understand it. But they, they do not proclaim God's Word as it's given to us in the Scriptures. God's Word as it points us to Jesus Christ as the only hope of salvation. Perhaps there is more of a famine for that kind of word. Jesus himself would meet with uh, uh, Jewish folks and after performing a, an amazing miracle whereby he fed 5,000 or more people with five loaves and two small fish, he had them coming after him again saying, keep it up, one more meal, do it again. I said, look, Moses, when he was out in the wilderness, he fed the people of Israel for 40 years, day after day after day. You just fed us once. Why should we follow after you? Show us a sign. Make it happen again. And so they began to diminish the significance of what Jesus had done. It's not enough. It's not sufficient. We need to see more. So Jesus had to address the folks of his day and challenge their blindness to the truth of what was before them. They did not really appreciate what God had done for them. And so it begins to draw some contrasts. It begins to talk about the, the, the manna that comes down from heaven, not just the, the manna that Moses fed in the wilderness, but he himself being the true man. He is the bread of God who gives us life. Now, when you look at the story there in John chapter 6, you wonder how it is that after being fed uh, like this in such a spectacular way, 5,000 people being fed, how is it that they did not accept what Jesus had to say about himself? Why did they not see him for who he was, the Messiah, the Christ? And many would not follow him. They would wander off in different ways. So Jesus had to explain why it was that so many would not believe in Him. And it's helpful for us to hear that today as well. When we see the Christian churches that are faithful in proclaiming the Word of God struggling to survive, and many of those that have abandoned God's Word but preach a Word which is palatable to the modern tongue, and they are flourishing, they're prospering, gathering many crowds to them, you must ask yourself, why? What accounts for this discrepancy? Why is it that those who preach the Word of God, the whole counsel of God, who carefully explain the way of salvation, are uh, not heard, not listened to, but rather these others? Jesus resolves it himself in his own day in God's electing grace. He says that all that the Father gives to me shall come to me. And with these words, he indicates that not everyone who's there in my audience are among those whom the Father has given to me, but only some, perhaps in that audience, but some are given to Jesus and entrusted to his care by the Father. And these are the ones that will come to Christ. And so the, the reason why many do not respond to the clear teaching of the Word of God is in part because of God's electing grace. He's been pleased to set aside some for salvation and to pass the rest by. In Reformed churches, we describe that as God's work of predestination or election. God sets apart a people for Himself. He chooses some out of the vast uh, mass of humanity, some whom he will set apart and give to Jesus Christ and trust them to his care, such that when Jesus comes into the world, he comes for their sake and for their sake alone. Jesus would 
be entrusted with their salvation and would do all that is necessary in fulfilling the will of his Father to obtain that salvation. And so within Reformed churches, in talking about God's work of predestination, we talk about something in the form of a TULIP, an acronym, which describes this work of God. We recognize first that man is totally depraved. He is corrupted by his sin and cannot do anything good. He is utterly dependent upon God to change him. And then there is God's unconditional election, whereby he sets apart a people for himself to be saved. Limited atonement, Christ enters into the world to save these particular people whom the Father has given to him. His death on the cross atones for their sins, and not for the sins of all men in general, specifically for these who are chosen by God. Irresistible grace, whereby the Spirit draws out of the world those whom God has chosen, those for whom Christ has died, the Spirit draws them to Christ, that they might receive the gift of salvation and be saved eternally. And then finally, P, the preservation of the saints, those whom the Spirit draws to Christ and brings to a saving knowledge of Christ, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit preserve in the course of life, such that ultimately they come to the final destination, glorification, salvation, eternal life. Jesus explains that here in these words before uh, his audience. The reason why many of you do not respond to the word of God is because God has chosen some to be saved. And all of those whom God has chosen, each and every one of them, will in fact be saved. They will come to Jesus. Now Jesus describes this work of the Father in not only electing but bringing folks to Christ. He describes it in a couple ways. He describes it as a drawing them to Christ. The Father if you will, drives them to Christ. The word has the idea of some resistance involved. And some folks don't like that thought. And yes, it's not the whole story, but it does tell one significant aspect of it. God uses a powerful influence in an individual's life to deliver them from their sins and to bring them to himself. Their hearts must be changed. Their eyes illumined. Uh, they, they need to be Show them the glory of Christ in a way that they can see and understand. And the Father draws them from their sins, which they would not leave on their own, to bring them to Christ. Uh, many commentators, or many folks in general, don't like that idea. William Barclay, in his uh, uh, comments on the text, always comes down after describing wonderfully how God draws people to himself. He comes down to finally saying, but... Man can resist God. Well, really? Is that what Jesus is saying here? That in the end, every man can resist God and go their own way? That entirely disrupts everything that Jesus has to say here. All that the Father gives to me shall come to me. What? Men will resist? No, they won't resist. The Father will draw them to me. They will resist? I don't think so. The Father will teach them. Everyone who's taught of the Father comes to me. Will they reject that instruction? Will they rebel against it? No. God will sovereignly, powerfully draw them to himself. And that's the only way whereby they will be saved. And he changes their hearts and minds in such a way that they will not resist God's grace, but rather run to that grace. Seeing that their hope of salvation. And so Jesus points us to God's sovereignty in this gracious work of salvation, where He draws us out of our sin, out of our corruption, and brings us to Jesus Christ powerfully and effectively. But at the same time, Jesus indicates that He Himself has come to do the will of the Father. He's not on a different program, He's not pursuing a different objective. He's received this mission from the Father to save a people, and when they come to Him, Jesus says, promises, I will in no wise cast them out. I will reject any of those who come to me. There's a, um, an illustration that some have used that 
the gate of salvation stands before us, and on the, the front of that gate, as you look at it, it says, Whosoever will may come. But then as you pass through on the other side, uh, you look back, and you see, All that the Father gives to me shall come to me. Salvation is much like that. God proclaims to all, repent of your sins, come to Jesus Christ and find life. Those who respond and come to Christ will be saved. Christ will not turn any aside. They will receive the full free gift of salvation and eternal life. But when they receive it, and when they come to know what God has done for them, they will look back and say, you know, God drew me to Himself all along the way. My salvation was God's work and not mine. And so Jesus says, whoever comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. His mission is to save these people whom the Father has given to Him. And so He goes to the cross to pay for their salvation. He will, at the end of, the, of, the, of human history, raise them from the dead and bring them into glory. It is His work. Will the Father fail in this mission to teach us of Christ? Will the Son fail to receive those who the Father gives to Him? Will the Son fail to raise those from the dead who are entrusted to His care and to bring them into heaven? Not at all. Christ will accomplish that great work that the Father has given to Him. Despite the rejection of the world at large. Jesus is the bread of life. He is the one who fully satisfies the human heart. All of its hungers, all of its passions and thirst. Christ is the one who satisfies our deepest needs. So whether we are uh, well fed in an industrialized society, an information age society, or whether we are struggling to find our next meal, Jesus is the one who fully satisfies our deepest needs. What many need to do is look beyond the earthly things to God's provision of salvation in Jesus. When he says that he is the bread of life, he is the one who provides our deepest need, eternal life. And by eating him, we are taking part in that great salvation meal. We receive through him the blessings of the forgiveness of sins and his righteousness to cover us. In communion with God, Jesus is the bread of life. And by feeding on Him and His work of redemption through faith, we receive that great gift. Let me conclude with this. When I was a boy, my mother would take us grocery shopping and go through the supermarket. And I would say to my mom, get me some Wonder Bread. Because Wonder Bread builds strong bodies 12 ways. <laughs> I had this image of myself getting big and strong when I grew up, and I wanted that Wonder Bread to fuel my nutritional needs. Some of you who are younger may not be familiar with that ad campaign, but years ago, uh, Hostess Brands uh, company used to make a product called Wonder Bread, it's still out on the market for how long, we'll see. Uh, but that was their advertising campaign. <clears throat> Wonder Bread builds strong bodies full ways. Today, Hostess Brands is going out of business. Now, in part, it's because one of their unions, a baker's union, uh, went on strike, and when the company told them, you must stop the strike or we'll go out of business, they didn't stop. They kept going, and the company said, okay, that's it. We're closing down the company. And so you may have eaten your last Twinkie, your last Ho-Ho, <laughs> your last Ding Dong, all the rest of these things, they're gone. Wonder Bread too. The story goes a little bit further back. Years ago, the government complained about the ad campaign that Hostess had for their Wonder Bread. Because it appeared that they were promoting something that was unique and different about their bread than other breads. Other breads also provide 12 nutrients to build your body. So what's so special about that? And so they began to harass Wonder Bread 
for this advertising campaign, and they had to change their campaign, that had an effect on their sales, and it began to slow their place in the market. And then the other factors, of course, came into that as well. People were looking for nutritious things, and not so much for the Twinkies and wing dings and all the rest. Wonder Bread. We might find uh, great satisfaction from the bread that we get on our market shelves, but it will pass through us and be done. This world is changing. It moves on from one moment to the next. You may want to place your faith in politics. You may want to place your faith in science, in psychology, all these various things, but they're constantly changing, constantly moving. Your own health, your family, everything about you is changing. Nothing remains the same. What is there that can bring you life? What can you depend upon? What will bring you eternal life that is beyond change? Jesus is that bread. Jesus is the only thing that will truly satisfy. Everything else will leave you hungry, looking for more. Wealth, pleasure, fame, power, all these things pass away. Jesus is the bread of life. And He alone can provide you with what you need. He is true wonder bread. He brings us everlasting life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your provision of grace for us delivering us from this world and bringing us uh, true bread, Jesus Christ. We pray for your blessing on us that we would uh, feed on Christ and be strengthened by Him. We ask it in His name. Amen. Let's at this time give ourselves to the Lord by bringing before Him our morning tithes and offerings. <laughs>
us. You love us and care for us. You provide for our needs. You bless us with many good things in life. We thank you that you bless us with Christ our Savior and made us new in Him. As we give ourselves and these offerings to you, we pray that you will be glorified in them. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please take your seats. <coughs> Let's turn to the Lord at this time and confess to Him our sin and seek His word of pardon. Father, we thank You for Your mercies to us. We thank You for Jesus who delivers us from sin and death. And we pray that You forgive us for where we continue to fall far short of that which You've called us to. Forgive us for our godlessness, our unholiness, our unrighteousness, our wickedness, transgressions, and sins. We pray, Lord, that you would wash away our unclean thoughts and desires, cleanse us from every wicked way, even every harsh or evil word. We pray, O Lord, that you would cleanse us from uh, all these many things, the way we have not loved you or others as well. We pray for your forgiveness through Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. The Lord promises to forgive us in these words from uh, the Apostle John. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let's pray. Father, we thank You that uh, in Christ we have uh, the cleansing and renewal, cleansing of our sins and renewal of our souls. We thank You for the work of Your Spirit who enables us to live before You. We pray that You would help us as we live in this world, to live for your glory and praise. We pray that you would have mercy on those who are needy today. We thank you for our membership and pray that you would watch over each of We thank you, Lord, for your mercies to us. And we pray that you would watch over us this day. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our final hymn this morning, uh, number 549, uh, sets our thoughts on Jesus, the joy of loving hearts. Hymn number 549, and we'll sing the first two, and let's stand the same.
May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Thank you.